to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's June 20th, uh, 2012, and um, it's cooler in Colorado, where a few of our guests are coming from tonight, and uh, hotter in uh, New York City, where some of the rest of us are. Uh, Gail, we didn't check the temperature there up in uh, Northern California. How's it up there? Well, oh, Gail, you're muted. <laughs> She's very good at muting. Anyway, right. unmute so you can we talk. Go. There you go. Yeah, we're actually we actually have air conditioning on today, and uh, so we've had a, about a week of a um, hundred degrees, you know, it's around that range. Yeah. yeah. How is it in Michigan, Jeremy? Welcome to the show, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, it's like 95, 96, so we've been dealing with uh, very humid weather the last couple of days. So yes, air conditioning is on. Okay. So a little chit chat here. Um, I'm kind of excited. Sometimes we have uh, a thousand different ideas and, and lots of things to do, and tonight we decided to focus in on one person, um, and that's Tommy Bateau. Um, who was on our show, I'm just going to go back and check, Tommy, but I think a couple of years ago even. I think um, it was about a year ago. Oh, that close? Okay. Yeah, it was just before I started working at uh, Windsor High. So. Great. So, um, and we have uh, a couple of other people joining us as we speak. But um, Gail Desler is with us. Um, um, Deb Kaufman. Uh, Jeremy Heiler, Monica Hardy is here, I'm Paul Allison, Shanti Musaha is here. Looks like Valerie Burton is going to be joining us as well. Why don't we go quickly and introduce ourselves, so unmute everybody and say hello. Gail, introduce yourself please. Hi everybody, I'm Gail Deffler and I'm, I'm in California. I live up in the Sierra foothills and I work down in the Sacramento area in the Elk Grove School District. Um, largest school, public school district in Northern California, actually. And, and say a little bit about what you're doing this summer. That's pretty cool. Just briefly. Um, well, we were a guest, and when I say we, my, my um, writing project colleague now. Can you pull your mic down a little bit? We, yeah. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. There we go. Better. My writing project colleague, uh, Natalie Bernasconi, and I um, have teamed up, and for this past year, we've been collaborating on a project to teach, to provide resources for students and teachers uh, around issues of digital citizenship. And so it's, it seems to keep building and building and um, next month we're actually going to head to Seattle, Washington, Redmond actually, and we're going to compete in the U.S. Uh, Microsoft's Partners in Learning U.S. Forum and, uh, with our digital citizenship project. So. The the uh, you know they're very upfront that what they're really looking for is STEM projects but um, you know we we've made the uh, first cut so the next cut um, ten projects out of the hundred coming to Seattle um, will go to the international forum in November in Athens Greece and and I just want to give some context also uh, when we started Youth Voices now good uh, dozen years ago, perhaps. Um, Gail had already done some uh, connecting people in blogs and so forth, and I think you had the, the name Youth Voices first, and we stole it from you. Um, and Gail has had... Uh, oh, you know what? You did steal it. There we go. I admit it. At any rate, so Gail's been with us for a long time and, and helping to connect teachers, and we hope uh, you can help us continue to do that. Um, out there somehow. Deb, you're uh, kind of brand new here. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Introduce I've yourself. Been, yeah. I've been lurking a lot. I've watched oh, uh, from the sidelines and hanging out with uh, Monica at the BU House. Um, I work at a library and I've homeschooled and unschooled my children and who are now 16 and 20 and getting ready to go off into the world and um, use the skills that they've taught themselves wow. and um, I just want other kids to have that kind of freedom of learning um, and so I'm interested in doing that now that I'm pretty much done educating them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm ready to support other children and I'm just here to learn. Very cool. Jeremy, introduce yourself. Please. Uh, my name is Jeremy Heiler. I am from the Chippewa River Writing Project in Central Michigan. Actually, it's located on uh, Central Michigan University's campus right in the middle of Michigan. And uh, I'm new here. Um, 
uh, to uh, Youth Voices, and uh, I am actually going to be using Youth Voices starting next week with our middle school writing camp at CMU that I will be co-directing with another one of uh, my CRWP colleagues. And uh, I am also going to be using it next year in my classroom as well. So I'm hoping that this next week will be kind of a trial run. I can see what worked, what didn't work, and then I can move forward with it for next school year. Cool. What's new with you, Monica? Welcome. Oh, man. Um, We're old. Whatever you want to say. I'm just, um, I'm really glad that Deb is here. Um, she lives in the same place as Tommy. And um, Deb is one that I've learned quite a bit from. Um, there's a couple unschooling moms that have taught me a lot about deliberately not teaching as I am working with um, the Thompson School District in Vision Lab in Loveland, Colorado. And I'll say what's new with me. I've been messing with uh, badge stack and uh, thinking about badges, and uh, and I and and fortunately we have Monica and others around to help me be skeptical about it. But <laughs> I have my own skepticism, which is fine. Um, anyway, Gail's holding something. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, so um, so we're, we're, we're I my so I've been having even though uh, like I go. And proctor a test, which makes me want to, you know, not be. It makes me ill. Um, and then I go and mess around with curriculum, and so that's been fun this week. Is uh, what I've been messing with. Shantanu, welcome. Shantanu, I, 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 I told Tommy that you were coming on and said he's the guy who does all those scratch projects. But introduce yourself, please. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Shantanu Saha. I. Uh, teach at the Baccalaureate School for Global Education in uh, Queens, New York. Uh, and I've been there for 10 years. The school is 10 years old, by the way, and uh, I've been there since the beginning. Uh, I've known Paul. You're, you're the only one who knows the password to the server, right? So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> Go ahead. I think so. <laughs> I wasn't joking. Go ahead. Yeah, because I think... I think I might, might have changed it at, at one point just so I could get in uh, <laughs> and, and do work on it. But uh, uh, I've been using Youth Voices uh, for years, and uh, this year I've uh, used it uh, with 8th uh, and 7th grade classes. And uh, uh, in fact, tomorrow and Friday, uh, the kids are, uh, my 7th grade kids are going to be putting up their final projects for the year uh, on Youth Voices. Uh, uh, they've been uh, creating games in Scratch, and uh, we're, uh, I'm going to have them put, it, put them up and uh, see what the reaction is. Uh, I, loved, I loved the way, and we'll have to do another show with, just with you sometime, but I love the way that your seventh graders looked at your eighth graders' projects before they did their own. Is right. That, that, was, that was pretty neat. That, that that was a deliberate thing, uh, you know. We had we had some uh, technical issues around that, like uh, as, uh, trying to do a search for those videos. Uh, essentially, either crashed Youth Voices or just uh, ground it to a halt <coughs> for a while. So I ended up just. Uh, uh, getting the URLs for the individual uh, posts and just uh, giving them a list and say pick uh, three out of this and respond to them. That works. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot going on getting the yeah, getting the JavaScript to work on on all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Valerie, welcome. Introduce yourself, please, and then we'll get to you, Tommy. I promise. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. No. Yeah, okay. Um, Valerie Burton, I teach at West Jefferson High School in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I'm now part of the Greater New Orleans Writing Project. I'm happy to say thank you, Paul. That's, that's partly due to you. So and when did that start? It started about two weeks ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's, like, that's, a, that's a lot of fun. Um, and I look forward to, I'm getting a new class. I'll, I'll be teaching soft, uh, juniors and seniors next year. And I look forward to getting my juniors and seniors onto Youth Voices and publishing, writing, and collaborating, and 
hanging out with you guys more than I did last year. Cool. So we have Chris Sloan at least twice here. <laughs> Chris, which part <laughs> of you is coming? When he gets here, he'll introduce himself. That's fine. Tommy, um, introduce yourself a little bit more. Um, you're, a, would you say you're a second or third year teacher? And then this is, uh, yeah, this is my second year teaching at Windsor High, and um, I, I did long term subs before that for about a year, um, and uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to see other people from Colorado. I feel almost like I should look this way when I'm talking to somebody farther <laughs> down on the on the list there. Um, but I see that both uh, Monica and Deb are from, from Colorado. So it'd be, I think it'd be great if we could get you know, more teachers using it around here. Because whenever I look at the map on Youth Voices, I always feel like, oh, geez, I'm going to out here. Um, so that'd be great if we can uh, figure out how to arrange that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I used uh, Youth Voices uh, quite a bit last year. I did three major projects on it. And then I also used it, um, you know, as a place for students to test out ideas and uh, look at other people's uh, work and comment on it. So I really, I really loved it for that. And of course, you've uh, you've done other things too. So uh, we'll we'll talk about that as well as we go. Okay. But but um, one of the things we thought, um, just in, in in talking about how to proceed here is that we give about 10 minutes on each of the three projects me okay. and, and then see uh, how that goes from there. Okay, that sounds good. Just so we can kind of cover some bases here. Okay, um, well, uh, I guess I'll start. I'll try out this screen share and see how that works. Um, and Okay, so let's see if I can get to something here. You got it. Yeah, here's the here's the first project um, that I did uh, with my media studies classes, and I was really looking for a way to have them uh, do a little bit of research and without you know making it seem like a research project. And so I, I put together this idea where they would uh, um, look for a um, first, we started out with one of the other missions on Youth Voices, which is the 10 questions one. And so they kind of explored around and discovered what they were interested in writing about. And then after doing that, I had them find an article that was uh, related to it in some way or other. And then in, when they wrote the articles, they would uh, combine uh, sort of you know, research uh, based on an official article somewhere along with um, something that made it attractive to, a, to an audience, like something you could put into a magazine. And um, they really got into it and they created some great projects um, and a really wide variety of different things, um, you know, incarceration rates, uh, role model for siblings, cars of the futures, etc., cetera, um, which is why I really like that uh, 10 questions, because you get a real wide variety. Um, the one I wanted to, to share with you is this one um, that this student did on Brandy Norwood. Um, and there just the only reason I want to share this one is she um, asked me to write a, uh, and see I had them include references down at the bottom and all that kind of stuff. So it's Tom, they really Tom, can, could you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but could you explain they, they were to find two sources. They had to be different in some way. Could you just go over that one more time? Yeah, they had to have two sources, at least two sources. This student had three, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the sources had to be more um, kind of scientific related to the bigger question. Um, like, for example, this student's question was on um, motherhood and what makes a good mother. And so she found one article that was, um, you know, kind of a psychological study, something like that. And then in addition to that, they had to find an article that had sort of a mass appeal, something that would make it um, interesting for an audience. Uh, mm -hmm. So if they were to publish it in a magazine, um, that is what would pull the people in. And so she found an article, I think it was actually from a blog on Brandy Norwood, who I think is a, a singer. I'm not I'm not really sure who it is, but it's some, some famous person. Um, and so in the article itself, they had to combine those and include information from both of the sources. Um, and so it's, uh, it's kind of it, it, research uh, and, you know, and, and bringing in um, many different perspectives. Um, and the only reason I included this one is a lot of these, um, whenever I've used youth voices or got students published in some way, 
um, <clears throat> students get into it more. And a lot of times students who really don't participate in my normal classes um, will do these kind of projects um, because they, they know that other people are going to be looking at it. Um, and this one I just wanted to share because she had me, she asked me to write a, uh, a letter of recommendation for colleges and I included this in it. I said, oh, this was a great example of, um, you know, uh, her creating something that was research based but it also was very artistic and explored a lot of different ideas and she ended up getting a scholarship based on it. Um, and so, I think just that aspect of Youth Voices is that it's out there and other people can see it is really important and uh, something that should be, you know, done more in school, I think. Do you, do you know what? Um, later, we're going to watch a video, so let's, let's also appreciate writing. And do you mind reading it? It's not oh, that sure, long. I can if you like. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, so this is Brandy Norwood, Is She the Ideal Mother? And uh, wonderful student, Joe is her name. She also uh, participated in uh, the movie project that I'll share later on. Um, and so the article goes, uh, Brandy Norwood is defined as a good mother due to several reasons. The first reason being she knows how to balance her uh, career and raise her daughter. I think her daughter's name is Sira in a mm -hmm. safe and private environment. Not only does Brandy want to create a safe environment for Sira, she also does not want her involved in television at her current age. A uh, numerous amount of people would argue and say it is Brandy's husband that has decided to keep her away from the media, but others would disagree and say she was the one who wanted her to stay away from the spotlight. Rather, it was her husband's or her idea to keep Sarah away from the media. Brandy has always expressed that if one, say, Sarah wants to get involved in television, she will be there to back her up. But f before so, she wants to make sure she is old enough to know the consequences of being famous and that she experiences how it is to have a somewhat private life. Brandy is also defined as a good mother because she puts Sarah's needs in front of her own, which is what a good mother should always do. For Brandy, trust is extremely important. Therefore, she made a decision to become her daughter's best friend and less of a parent. Brandy seems to think this is the right way to raise her daughter due to the fact that Sarah will always be honest with her no matter what. Other parents could argue that this is an incorrect way to raise a child, but if the method of being a friend before parent is more effective, what is so wrong? A good mother should not only be caring and loving toward her child, but also her family. The treatment the mother's family get will in the future affect the relationship the child has with the rest of her family. Randy Norwood sets another good example for a good sister. <clears throat> her brother Ray J has been during countless uh, reality shows and is mostly known for his music, which Brandy has been supporting him in from the beginning till the end. Brandy has also been involved in some reality shows Ray J has been uh, doing, which would of course make their relationship stronger and keep them closer together. In an article uh, published by the SF Gate, they talk about women's image of the 21st century mom and how every woman has their own opinion on what a good mother is. The article describes good mothers as hardworking but harried, loving and indulgent, seeking support from friends rather than family, and feeling guilty, guilty, guilty about not doing a better job at home. Deborah Tannen, a professor of linguistics at Georgetown University and the author of the best-selling You're Wearing That, Understanding Mothers and Daughters in Conversation, explains that daughters seeing their mothers as confidants and best friends is a development that's unusual in the history of humankind. But is Deborah Tannen correct or is Brady Norwood method of being a friend more effective? Mothers are not just the women that feed their children, get them dresses, and drive them to school every day. They are also role models. A survey was done and over a third of the women say that sometimes uh, feeling like they're turning into their mothers, which they thought was a nice feeling. 47-year-old Janet Bengston, who is a mom to three teenagers, uh, teenage sons, explains that I realized recently that I talk the same as my mother, that when my feelings are hurt, I get very quiet, hold my breath, and count to ten like she used to do. So in other words, mothers can have a huge impact on our lives, whether we grow up with one or one day want to become one. We all need to figure out how we want our children to be raised because eventually one day it is who they will become. And then she has the references listed down at the bottom. Cool. So who would like to uh, talk back to Tommy about that piece? What do you see there that that student's doing? Jump in, folks. <laughs> Well, can I can I start off by asking Tommy a question? Sure. Um, the the ten question whatever what was that again? The ten question like inquiry thing that the kids had to do. Yeah, that's that, it's one of the missions on Youth Voices. I think okay. it's under Literature and Inquiry. Right. And I don't know who wrote it, but it it was there when I uh, 
was looking around last year. Okay. And uh, in it, they have to, um, I, I spent a couple of days working on it, and they spend uh, time writing 10 questions about the world that they have, and then also 10 questions about themselves. And then after that, they kind of narrow it down to one that they're really interested in. And so, you know, they get a wide range of questions, and then they narrow it down to one. And I, I've used it several times. It worked great for this project. I also used it for a, uh, a research, another research paper that, I'll, that we did postmodern uh, movies with. Um, and I find it's just a great way for them to really uh, narrow down their ideas and figure out what it is they want to research. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was something you created or if it was actually on there, so that's, that's good to know. Yeah, it's actually on Youth Voice. I could try to find the, the link for you. I, my, favorite, my favorite emails to Tommy are the, the stuff your students are putting up is really great. Um, guess what I want. And what I always want is his description of uh, what his students did. And so we do get, um, eventually we get those up and then the student's work is, is next to that description. So most of what you see here will be there available on Youth Voice somewhere. Um, I'll go back and, and say that that idea of the ten self ten world questions comes from uh, James A. Bean, which who's an Australian I, I, educator and wrote a book about democratic education. I think it was. Um, he he actually imagines that the whole middle school curriculum could be um, based around getting just kids questions, um, and and so it's all about. So, and, and I think it's important in Youth Voices because uh, it uh, kind of makes clear that what we hope kids are working on are the writing and doing projects on things that they're passionate about, things they really care about, questions they really have. Um, so, yeah, great. Um, it's great to have it come back here that way. Um, other thoughts about the, the piece of writing? Um, Research is also a really important thing that happens a lot on, on Youth Voices. And, and what's so interesting is to see how different people do research. Um, and I don't know if Chris Sloan is uh, able to talk to us yet, but it's fascinating to watch his kids do research, and it's been fascinating to watch Jamal, a teacher here in the Bronx, have her kids do research, and, and to kind of see different takes on that. And certainly, um, Tommy, your take with this news item was a research project of a sort. How would you see it as research? Um, how did it compare to other research projects you've done? Well, OK. Um, I think generally, uh, when students think of research, uh, I mean, what I've experienced is they tend to focus just on, uh, whoa. Picking up a lot of noise there. That's okay. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. They tend to focus just on the um, kind of the scholarly articles, and they um, they don't get into it so much. And so I was really looking for a way for them not only to find out information about whatever subject it was they were interested in, but also find a way to kind of relate to it more and to compare it to other people that they're interested in. And so I really just tried to focus on, you know, you have to get the research, but you also then have to find some way to relate it to a larger world. You know, if you can find um, a, a musician or a, a, um, a media personality that you really like that's also thinking about this issue, um, then that's great because they can kind of compare their own thoughts to what another person that, they're, that they kind of consider as a mentor is thinking about the same thing. And so I really try to just use it as a way to have them engage more with the idea and see it from another perspective rather than just their own and kind of the official research. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Any other thoughts anybody have? Any questions about this project? Or ideas you'd like to push us and Tommy on? Anything? I, yeah, right. actually, I, I just, this is Gail, I just wanted to comment. Um, I already liked the project when I saw the heading that it was on news and giving kids chances to explore things they care about in the news. Um, you know, I think one thing that has disappeared in the testing environment, and I'm going to speak more from the elementary schools because it seems like this last year I've been hanging out um, more there than middle or high school, 
Um, but just that, you know, no things when kids would bring the news article, you know, and give away the news article. Um, I don't see that anymore. And so uh, somewhere um, in the curriculum, I, and I think, you know, starting in elementary, students have to have these opportunities to explore the news and to delve into those pieces that really intrigue them. So I think it's a great project. Great. Shall we move to another one? OK. Um, let's take we can uh, always circle back if people Sure, yeah. I want to take a look at the um, project that I did that was a real multimedia project, because that's another reason I like Youth Voices. It's a way to, to really um, you know, share the multimedia aspects, which I have, this is the only way I've really found in a classroom to do that. Um, so I'll take a quick look at the, the mission that I created that was with that. Um, that is here, um, and it's on Youth Voices. And uh, basically, they, we started with the same uh, 20 questions mission. Here's a link to it. Um, and then they needed to find... Do, do they have to do the 20 questions again, or can they just go back to what was there already? This, yeah, th this was a totally different class. This was my American oh, was, Lit okay. class. Okay. Yeah, okay. so we did the same thing in my American Lit class. Um, and then once they had found a question that they were interested in, there were several elements that they had to include in the multimedia uh, presentation. And we were reading the book, The Things They Carried. And so they had to have um, some passages from the book itself, the things they carried that related to their question. And then they had to find um, an interview, um, you know, clips from movies that they could download off of YouTube. Um, and then they also had to uh, talk about how their view on the issue or the question had changed through the process. And they recorded that as well and then put that layer of audio over the top of it. And I've got one, if I can figure out how to uh, get back to So you to get, this here. You're going to YouTube now? Yeah, I'm going to YouTube. And let's see if I can get the right one in here. Okay. So as, you, as you're doing it, let me just uh, a sidebar and sure. say that one of the things I've been messing with is, is um, putting youth voices on uh, mobile devices. And, and that is, it, there's actually, a, uh, it's actually, if you go on your phone, you, you can find it there. It still kind of needs a lot of work. But um, clearly, we need to move to HTML5. Um, but there are ways to do that with video and with um, audio. So that's uh, just a note for the future. <laughs> but yeah. OK, go ahead. Sorry about that interruption. But. Trying to, let's see if I can. So we have an American Lit Project on there. Is that the right place? Is it on? Yes. Um. Can everybody see it? Yeah, but it's not, it's not playing for it's us. It's not playing, yeah. Now you're back, Tommy. Uh, is the video playing now? No. We see you. Hit the YouTube um, app, I think, at the top. Whoop, where'd you go? Okay. Well, maybe... No, no, maybe. no, it's good. Keep going. It was my fault. Okay, is it... Go back. Okay, are you seeing the video now? Do, are you screen sharing? Okay, so hello, folks. Um, wait, Tommy, go, go back and pause for a second. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you see the video if you're if you're in the Hangout? No. No. Okay. So what you need to do is click on YouTube at the top, and you'll be able to see it. I think. They just changed all this. Tommy and I were playing with it. We think we have it right. <laughs> and uh, Tom, and I'm. So Tommy, uh, go ahead and.
Okay, so that was a clip of him speaking a passage from the book. Okay, so maybe that's enough of the video. I don't know if you want to watch the whole thing or not. No, that's good. Um, and so toggle back out of YouTube, folks. And so just a quick check. Did that work? Were you able to see it? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, okay great. Right, um, yeah. Okay, so this student, uh, his question, of course, was on um, robotics. He was very interested. That's Christian coming in, and I'm going to mute him until he gets in. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. Um, so that student was very interested in robotics. He was in actually uh, another teacher that started at the same time I did taught a class on robotics, and he was in that class, and that was the only thing he talked about all semester long. Um, and in the in the multimedia project, he included um, you know that, that interview with Isaac Asimov, and he had uh, clips from iRobot, and he also had passages from the book that he was reading and including over the top of uh, some of those images of robotics from the military. Um, and so he was really able to get totally into that topic and see it from many, many different perspectives uh, and see how it's been used in movies, how it's been used in the military, how authors have written about it, and how it related to uh, the book that we were reading, the things they carried. Um, so th that's, that's how I designed that project to really allow students to uh, get into different layers of it. Um, and it, it worked great. Um, I would change, the only thing I would change is on Youth Voices, in addition to the video, I had them post underneath it their reflection. Um, so you can kind of read in the reflection, um, you know, why they were including all these different clips. Because um, sometimes the clips, when you're watching, it's not really clear what they were getting at. But when, the, when you have the reflection there, it's really works really well. But uh, the only thing that I would change is that I didn't get in um, MLA uh, citations or anything, and that's part of the Colorado standard. So next year, in the reflection itself, I would have them cite, and so we can meet that part of the standards. Um, but other than that, I thought the project worked really good. And the students, uh, again, just totally got into it. Um, you know, a lot of times at that class, I was able to have the computer lab every day for the semester. It's normally a business class, but it was during that teacher's planning period. Um, and, you know, a lot of times in uh, classes like that where you're on computers all the time, um, you know, you'll look around and people will be doing whatever. Um, but when we were doing this project in the last uh, few weeks of the 
of the school year, um, there were times when I would, you know, leave the room to go download something for somebody and I would come back and the whole room would be silent and people would just were totally focused on, you know, trying to incorporate their videos and get their point across. So I, I really, I was really impressed with how much the technology um, just made them get into it. Um, so I'm definitely going to do it again next year. Uh, are there Thank any questions about the taste of that project? Yeah, let's let's please please folks speak up. <laughs> <laughs> what well, I, have, I have an observation. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean one of the things I notice is uh, this idea of uh, integration. You know, you're using a lot of different media and sources. Uh -huh. in your in your the first post we read, you know, it was like uh, something from a book, something from an article. Uh, and then we see in this latest uh, the video, we've got a lot of different sources being integrated. Um, are you doing that, would you say, on purpose? Or are the kids just finding those things and it's coming about naturally? Or It's funny. I think that's just part of the way that I think about things because in I don't really... In with this multimedia project, I intentionally set out to have them include many different sources, the book, um, you know, an article, uh, various places that they've uh, found videos or interviews. Um, but I, I, that just, I always tend to do that because I just think when people see more than one perspective, they uh, tend to get more engaged and to get a wider view of, uh, of the subject itself. And, and I find, you know, in, in high school, it's really easy to, uh, to see sort of questions as yes or no. And that's one reason I called this a postmodern uh, research uh, multimedia project was I wanted them to see that there are so many different ways to view everything and that there is no real yes or no answer. There's no, you know, oh, this is what robotics is all about. You know, you can only really say, well, this is what this person thought about robotics, but then this person thinks this. And so I kind of, I don't know, I think that's just part of my personal philosophy and the way I approach things. Other thoughts? <laughs> what was your, what was your, um, Tommy, what was your criteria for the students as far as, uh, you know, and I use the term, I use the term grading loosely, but like um. what, how, how are they graded? I mean, how much did you focus on, you know, the research aspect of it? How much did you focus on grammar? You know, all, all, any of those things that you could include in it? Sure. I, uh, well, most of my projects, this, um, the, the multimedia project, I ran out of time. It was just, it was bigger than I thought it was going to be. But generally what I do is I have them do a first draft and then a peer review, which is another reason I like a Youth Voices. I've got, um, if we have time, I'll show you a podcasting project I did, not on Youth Voices, but similar type concept. Um, and then after the peer review, a final draft. And so normally my grades are based on uh, improvement from the rough draft to the final draft and then they have to meet certain criteria um, you know like in the research they have to have a citation um, and whatever the criteria is um, so that's kind of the way I approach it I find it's the easiest for me to do and the easiest for them to uh, feel like if they're improving they're going to get a good grade you know no I understand are, are you still using Docs to start things? Or? Google Docs, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I use Google Docs a lot, um, and then the uh, you know should we take a look? I would love to share this uh, podcasting project that I did with you also. Then it's kind of got some peer review elements in it. Sure. Um, so I'll go back to the screen share. Let's see if I can find it. So was that one queued up? Doesn't matter. We can get to. Yeah, I've got it here. Cool. This one was a, uh, this was in my American Lit class. It was the first semester, so it was actually a different class because at semester we, all the students basically change classes um, than the one that did the multimedia project. Um, but it was a uh, personal narrative and I put them all up as podcasts. So they would have their rough draft posted. You can see the rough draft for this one is here. And then at the bottom, they would have their, their podcast of it. And so once they had gotten the recording done, and we have a set of uh, iPods, so they just use the iPods with microphones to do that. Um, then I had uh, students that were in a college level 
composition uh, and lit class do the peer review. So they would go in and read the rough draft and listen to it at the same time. So you get a really uh, much higher mm -hmm. level of engagement because when you hear it and read it at the same time, it's much easier to tell what people are talking about. Um, and so then after that, the students made their rough draft, made their final draft based on the comments that came through this peer review form, which is on a Google form. Um, you know, so it gives you everything in an Excel sheet, and then you just send it out to the students. Um, so after that, they created their final version, and we put the final version up as well. And so I've got the the whole class. Um, and the reason I chose this one to share with you is the final version. You can see you put in paragraphs and and other things. But what I really like is this last line. This student says, um, this is absolutely positively 100% factually with no doubt in my mind, the longest paper I have ever written. <laughs> and again, it's uh, for some reason, when you use technology and allow the students to kind of explore on their own some, they just, they get much more engaged. I've always had students that um, normally don't really produce anything um, will participate in, uh, in projects like this. And that's one of the reasons I really like technology a lot. So uh, Tommy, I wanted to circle back on the um, multimedia project for a second. Yeah. Because um, you brought up the MLA citation issue. And sure. I, think it, I think it goes beyond that, the questions that that project raises for me. Sure. Um, and you know, there are lots of parts of that project that I love. but. If I could say, the, the videos t tend to be, um, you can, s if you really spend some time with them, you can kind of see what the kid was, was putting together. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you, it needs the reflections. Right? Yeah. So, oh, you know what, here's, what, here's what I thought. They're like collages, right? Yeah. They're, they're collaging together media from other places, and there's something wonderful about that. But there's also something kind of almost unfinished and needs a little more um, yeah. embedding or something. I'm not sure what it needs. But I just wanted to bring that up. It's, a, it's not just that they're not citing the sources. It's that they're using the sources in ways that we haven't taught them to use before. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, like, I, definitely, I definitely agree. And I do think this is a, this is a project that I want to work more with because um, I had... I've, I've kind of was putting together a sample um, while the students were working on it. And in that one, I was trying to, um, you know, solidify it a little bit more or make it a little bit um, more solid how the research was connected to what my topic was about. But I ran into the same problem that the students did, that you need something um, written down to kind of solidify it. And that's why um, the reflections are, are important. And you can, uh, you know, get uh, that element, I think, included in the reflections on it. And, and related to all of that, I think, is um, on Youth Voices, some of them are 10 minutes long, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, my students looked at them and said, oh, those are really long, and yeah. didn't respond, right? Sure, so, yeah. So how, how to make a research project um, accessible to, you know, they need to be shorter, I guess, or, they, yeah. or something. And, um, and an most question. of them... Yeah. Yeah, most of them, when I was going through, you know, uh, looking at them at the end, uh, most of them would be improved a lot just by cutting it down on, you know, the length. And so next year I was thinking when I did it that I would make it a requirement that they're, you know, maybe five minutes long max, something like that. Uh -huh. um, and, and then you would have more, because you would have a little bit tighter uh, control on what was going into the actual video, you would have more focus also on what, why they were including that particular clip. And so it would be a little bit more related to uh, the research aspect of it, too. Like I said, this was the, the first time I've ever done it. So it was a fascinating, uh, um, it, you know, process to go through. Absolutely. Um, and you've written about it very clearly on the, um, on the mission. And we can right. try it, too. And that's the wonderful thing about Youth Voices, I hope is that, uh, you know, we can try our own version of it, and you can yeah. see what we do, and you can, you know, we can keep building together. So yeah. thank you for putting that out there. Sure, there, was, sure. there was a third project. Do we want to try oh, to yeah. get to that? 
Yeah, let's do it. Um, actually, there's two more projects that I'd like to share with you. One, <laughs> one that we did. Let me see if I can get this screen uh, cast thing going again. Screen share. Um, okay, this one is over oh, here. Uh, it's called Book Drum, and it's this web page, BookDrum.com, that produces. Um, you know, it's basically. It's not really a review. It's kind of like information that goes along with a book. And uh, we made one. My class made one for the book, The Things They Carried. And so they, they wrote this kind of introduction section. And then for they did these bookmarks. For each 25 pages, they would find things that happened or were spoken about in the book that they were unfamiliar with, um, like this P38 mm -hmm. can opener. There's the quote from the book, and somebody went and found a picture of it and described what that actually is. And they can include videos. Um, I think down at the bottom here, there's a, a video of a, of a geisha putting on makeup, because um, that was mentioned in the book. Uh, the quote is, a hospital with warm beds and cute uh, geisha nurses or geisha, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, and so they do that for each 25 pages. And then they have a review. Um, they talk about the setting. Um, this is the region in Vietnam where the book happened. And this is there's uh, one scene that happens throughout the book about a river. Um, uh, that was the setting. Let's see, they also have a glossary. So any words that they find that they don't know, they have definitions of those, talk about the author, then there's an interactive map that has links to all of the various bookmarks that are map locations, um, and then and, a summary. And the whole class is working on the one book term? The whole class, yeah, the whole class is working on it. So basically what I did was, actually I had a, I did the same thing with the Raisin in the Sun, kind of to get them ready for it. I just created a wiki. It's all in the same format, though. And so they'd already done it once in groups, you know, so they kind of knew what the process was. But then when we were doing this book, sort of for each section of reading, they would have to turn in one bookmark and one glossary term. And then, you know, various students chose to do the author page or the review page or whatever. And um, and it was they did well enough on it that they actually published it. So I was, I was really happy about that. Um, they did a great job on it. Um, and they were you know, they got quite engaged in it, and they know a lot about the book now. I mean, there's a lot of bookmarks in there that I didn't know what they what they were all about. Um, so that was one project I wanted to talk about. And then the other one that we did on Youth Voices was this letter writing. Um, and it was with the same book, The Things They Carried. Um, and in The Things They Carried, the opening chapter is called The Things They Carried. And they the author goes through all of the things that the soldiers are carrying on their body in the war. Um, and it's, you know, all, all sorts of various things. Yeah. So could you just read the mission? And oh, by sure. the way, and, and so, and, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, so youthvoices.net, and then go to missions, and you can find this description there, and the student yeah. work attached to it. Yeah, it's okay. under uh, literature and inquiry. Um, okay, so for this mission, we were using the short story, The Things They Carried, from Tim O'Brien's novel, The Things They Carried. This great lesson plan was developed by uh, Suzanne Rubenstein. The lesson plan and many useful handouts can be accessed at NCTE's Read, Write, Think website. There's supposed to be links um, embedded yeah. under there, but they didn't come through for some reason. I'll oh. have to... You sent that to me. Fix that. I'll fix it. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she created this, and it's it was a, it worked great in my class. Um, first, the class spends some time discussing the things they carry every day. I ask where they traveled from to get to the class, and I also ask them what they carried with them on the journey. In their list, they detail things found in their backpacks, pockets, cars, purses, and wallets. Next, we read the things they carried, and students focus on Tim O'Brien's use of the list. We spend some time talking about the things the soldiers carry, and we consider the symbolic weight of these various things. We notice how they can be a positive or negative weights and concrete or abstract items. We go back to the list the students generated about what they carry, and they add anything they may have thought of while we're reading Tim O'Brien's story. Then we continue to discuss the objects on their list. What is the symbolic weight of the objects? Things that are more important have more weight, but each item will be different for each student. For some, the weight of their homework is heavy, something they think about all evening. For others, of course, homework doesn't signify any weight at all. These are personal stories which convey the weight of these objects. 
We also think about things they carry that are not concrete objects. Things like guilt, stress, love, family, memories, and pain all come up here. And we spend some time thinking about po both positive and negative weights. Next, students reflect on the list and pack, eh, excuse me, and pick the three most important items. They free write for five minutes on those three items. For the next class, students will create a rough draft of a letter about the one item that they are most interested in writing about. Create a letter to the person that is most connected to that item. For example, if a student chooses to write about a class ring from high school, they will write a letter to the person that the class ring is most connected to. If they chose to write about a bracelet that a girlfriend gave them, then they will write a letter to the girlfriend in which they describe why it is important. This is an area that students sometimes struggle with, yet they must come up with a specific person to write to. A lot of times students will say, oh, can I write to, you know, everybody in the high school or something like that. And I say, no, it has to be one person. Um, the letter must contain a vivid description of the thing you carry, an idea of the weight of the thing you carry, a sense of whether this is a positive pleasure or a negative burden, an explanation of why you carry this thing, a story involving the thing you carry, and a clear sense of who the letter is written to and why they are connected to the item. So these are the required elements. Um, students sometimes have a difficult time coming up with a story related to the item. I often have to help them understand some of the elements of narratives in order to get a story included. If they put in some dialogue, blocking, setting, description, character description, or flashback, they will usually get on the right track. We then use the reader response sheet for a peer review and focus on revisions for the final draft. My final grades are usually based on improvement from the rough draft to the final draft and the inclusion of the elements of the letter described above. And then I have examples over on the side and they, they really range quite widely. Like this one is really funny. The student wrote about a wallet. Then he, he actually writes to the boss of the fast food restaurant that he works in because he worked at the restaurant, he could afford the wallet. And then um, this one is really a heavy one. It's to his dad and it's about his mother um, and, and her, her death and it was really you know, a heavy one to read. Um, the weight of words, she writes about a letter that she's carried around with her from a friend and, and how that's affected her. And, and it just r really ranges all over the place. And so it, it was another good project that uh, you get, a, you know, students can really go in many different directions with it. Very cool. Feedback, folks, or thoughts, or... <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I, I wanted to. Uh, no, go ahead. Fred, go uh, ahead. Welcome. Thanks. I, I had a question about the uh, multimedia project. Sure. It, it, I didn't really get to explore any of them, just the little moment that you shared there. But yep. it, is it essentially a, a series of clips? And, it didn't, and how exactly did they put that together? Is that yep, like we, using a, an, edit, uh, an iMovie editor or something like that? Yes, we uh, were in a, we had a computer lab for the whole semester for the class. And so that's why I was able to do a lot of these projects. Um, and we used, uh, in this class, we used Movie Maker, Movie Maker Live, I think mm -hmm. it's called. Mm -hmm. And um, they would just, um, they layered in audio. They had to record their own voice reading passages from the book that related to the topic. And they also had to include um, kind of how their understanding of the question they were researching had evolved through the process. Um, and then they had to share kind of where they gathered the information. They had to have kind of background music that related to the um, to the question in some way or other. They had to find some media clips. It could be from movies or television or wherever they wanted. Um, it could be music videos that related to the same subject that they were working on. And um, I was really trying to get them to find many different uh, perspectives. It, all, it was really related to this book, The Things They Carried, which is a postmodern book. So I wanted them to explore that concept that you know, there, there are many different ways of looking at the same research question, and I wanted them to, you know, share what they found, all the different various ways that they, um, that they learned about their question. And, uh, and like, I, like I've said before, it was uh, kind of the first time I did the project, so next time I'll, uh, I'll have some, some different ways of approaching it for sure. Um, but I still, I like the concept. I think it's, and I, I really think it's the way, you know, it's the way media works now. Um, 
so much of media is a compilation of different ideas and right. um, you know gathering information in that way is a is a valid part of the world I mean my daughter is two years old and and you know the way she goes on my smartphone with the videos of Sesame Street clips is amazing so I just think that students today are so used to looking at the world in that way that if we can figure out some way to start harnessing that and start showing that that is a valid way of uh, approaching the world and of learning about the world, it's going to be to everyone's advantage. I wanted to mention a, a, a platform that I just discovered called WeVideo, wevideo.com. They, I just went to a presentation by them at Google. They made a partnership with Google so that there it's a it's a an online collaborative video editing environment. Hmm. Looks very powerful, and they've made an arrangement with Google so that it's part of your Google Drive. So uh, I think this is really going to be a a a. a open up a lot of possibilities for this kind of collaborative multimedia work in, in the classroom. Oh, Fred, that sounds great. Absolutely. I, I've messed with that a little bit, though. And one caution is that um, it gets pretty costly really fast. Oh, really? Yeah, that, yeah it does. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, they, they charge by minute for uploading um, the stuff, and so... Anyway, well, not in <laughs> not in the caution. drive, not in the drive, and uh, they are exploring educational options that, well, good. that will get some of that cost down. So, good. Yeah, yeah that was I my que first question. <laughs> yeah, but right now it's like, uh, ooh, I have to pay all that to uh, upload this thing I just edited. And yeah, I was, <laughs> uh, wasn't so happy about that. But anyway, yeah, back back around a little bit to Tommy's work. And, and I think if we could go around and just uh, get uh, comments here at the end, um, that would be a really nice thing to do for Tommy, if you could just tell Tommy what you've been thinking about as you've been looking at his work. Tommy, thank you for sharing um, here tonight. Um, I'm going to start by saying that that um, description of the letter writing project um, was wonderfully written and I could really follow your thinking and all that um, and then I want to revise it right <laughs> but sure. I want to I want to keep that part and then I want to think about how could we it's like a genre question how could we take his your description of your process and and make it into assignments that other people can do too so that's, oh, yeah. that's some of the work that I want to play with uh, this summer but yeah, but I, I don't want to I don't want to de-emphasize at all the power of that that first narrative of how you how you had students go through this is really important. Um, sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. Other, other comments, uh, Valerie. Why don't we start backwards and start with you? <laughs> Just because you're all the way at the end of my list here. No problem. <laughs> um, Tommy, you have given me a, a lot of ideas that I hope I can make come to fruition. Um, I loved the research problem project, and I love the letters. And I say that, Paul, I think I'm thinking, too, because our literature is divided into time periods of genre, I'm wondering if I don't have the kids figure out what would be in the pockets or the purses or whatever of a character during a certain time period. You just have, you've got my wheels spinning, and I appreciate that because you've given me a lot to think about. And I am inspired by your good work. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank Not you. Gonna... Um, just to uh, turn off the... Uh, there you are. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so, uh, you yeah, know, I was uh, thinking about... Uh, all of the research that you that you had the kids do and the variety of research, and I was thinking since uh, uh, my ninth and tenth grade classes, uh, I have to teach them how to do research, and uh, uh, you know it's it's gotten me thinking about how I can uh, expand the types of uh, things, uh, types of sources that they can find, and uh, uh, how they can use them 
uh, you know, in in more creative ways. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the questions that I had in looking at all of this is that uh, you know, aside from not uh, citing the research, at at, at some points uh, looking at it as an outsider, I couldn't tell what was the uh, kids' ideas and what they borrowed from, you know, what, what was what came from the source. So that's something that I want to be able to work on, uh, being able to have the kids uh, properly, you know, say, you know, I got this idea from somebody else and this is my take on it rather than uh, having them sort of presented as their own. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> Jeremy, <clears throat> well, you've definitely uh, I, the research. The, the research part that you did was incredible because um, it's just kind of um, kind of cements a lot of things for me that we had discussions with at our uh, our department meetings this year about what what does a research what does research look like for middle schoolers and you know doing a four to five page research paper is not the way to go. Um, you know, in, in the main thing is is that they understand what is effective research. It's not it's not pumping out a four to five page paper, um, and you know, and I really like what I'm seeing w with what you did here with Youth Voices, and it's just kind of cementing a lot of things with what I want to do with my kids next year um, with research. Um, and one of the things that I would encourage, because this is what I'm going to be doing next year, because I got it from one of my colleagues, is to have your students go back, and I think Paul had mentioned it earlier too, is reflect have your students reflect on their pieces um, because I think that's more powerful than anything when those kids can go back and look at their writing and say and you know and look at what what was good about it, what was bad about it and how they can make it better so but great job so it gives, it gives me a lot of things to think about for the for next year <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, and that's and that's uh, and I just wanted to say mm -hmm. that's um, but actually both uh, what Jeremy said and Shantanu um, is a question that I've been debating ab about a lot, and uh, you know, I my students, I always feel like it would be great if they could write four to five page uh, research papers, and I do think they learn a lot about writing by doing that. Um, and I think next year, what I'm going to try to do is to do this project earlier because I kind of did it at the end of the year, and I just ran out of space, um, and so I would prefer to do it earlier in the year and then have that time at the end, you know, uh, for reflection and, and going through um, and maybe writing not five pages but uh, something to kind of uh, give it a little bit more weight and a little more heft as far as a uh, research paper goes. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough question because the student, a lot of the students that get involved in these um, technology and movie type projects. If I did a four to five page paper, they wouldn't turn in anything. All right. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. I, I struggle with that because I, I agree that it's an important thing, but I just I know for the uh, for some of my students that's not going to help them. So I don't right. I haven't figured out the exact way to do it perfectly yet, but I'm going to keep trying until I do find out a great way. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Gail, you have any final thoughts? I I do. I just.
the badges that you created that align with Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. I'm back, it. and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll <laughs> see if that got recorded. I think it did. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Go ahead. I think so. Anyway, I, I, we should uh, wrap up for tonight. Uh, but Chris or um, Fred, do you have any final thoughts here? Yeah. Good. Uh, one of the things that I heard Tommy say a few times is, you know, the technology made a big difference. And I think that's true, but I think there are some other things that are worth unpacking, and it's too late right now. But, you know, I think about the audience that Youth Voices affords is a different kind of thing. And I think there's some kind of thing in, in them constructing their knowledge, you know, whether it's cobbling together a lot of different sources or media that's, you know, I mean, the technology allows that, but there's some deeper things that's kind of happening that makes it a more powerful thing. So um, I think there's just more to say about exactly what's going on there that makes those things more engaging. And to me, part of it is audience. It's a real authentic audience, and, then, and partly it's the that students can construct their knowledge from the media that they know, but um, more to say on that. Yeah, so they're making discussion posts. In other mm -hmm. words, they're making a post to invite discussion. Um, so yeah, that, that that's really good to to be thinking about, um, and not easy at all. <laughs> Fred, well, I I just am so impressed with the variety of the projects and the variety of the approaches that you're using. Uh, you know, I I work with um, school-wide interventions where we're trying to encourage teachers to just try one thing. Mm. And <laughs> you've got a half a dozen different <laughs> projects, each one fascinating going. Mm. It's, it's very impressive. I, 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 we don't have time now, but the, one of the questions I thought of that I would love to hear your reflections on is how do you deal with bumping up against controversial issues? Have you gotten yourself in trouble around things like that? <laughs> um, yeah, I have. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just a, a risk you take. And with some, especially with the Google uh, Docs and everything that's connected to Google, I kind of am in control because it's not out on the, uh, you know, it's on the Internet, but it's restricted to our school. Um, but when you do youth voices or, you know, create a wiki or publish on Book Drum or put, you know, movies that they made from media studies up on YouTube, you have to be aware of that. Um, and I haven't gotten into any uh, trouble or anything, but my, uh, my district has made it very clear that they're, you know, a little worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how you're working with other teachers and so forth um, is an interesting question to go to also. But um, maybe we could find some of that on your blog. Can you say sure. your blog's name again? Um, yeah, I have. In the notes, but go ahead. Yeah, I have, uh, I have two right now. One is my one that I've been keeping for a long time uh, called Cyb English, C-Y-B-E-N-G-L-I-S-H dot blogspot dot com. And uh, that one I include a lot of different stuff. You know, I put up, you know, videos that I've seen that I think relate to education and um, et cetera. And then I also have one at Windsor, which is called Windsor High Tech dot blogspot dot com and it's just projects that I do at the school and it, it's it, they some other teachers use it but so far it's basically been my blog um, and so it has all the projects that I've been doing at Windsor and there there are other ones I did a whole project on gender studies with Clogster and I did a character analysis with Storybird and I did some really cool project with um, making movies for my media studies class. That, oh, that one was great. The, the students really loved that one. Um, right. So those are all on the blog. You can check those out. Great ending. Uh, we, got, we, do, we do have to end here, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you all for hanging out with us. And uh, Tommy, thank you so much for sharing some of your work. Um, one quick question. Uh, you've been in the profession for a couple of years. Are you going to stay for a while? 
Yeah, I'm working next year again at Windsor, and I've got two uh, classes that will be in the lab. So I'll have two American Lit classes that are in the lab all semester. Um, right. mm -hmm. So they're really, they, lo they love the, the integration of the technology there. Um, and then and after that, we'll see. I, but so far, I'm really loving it. I, I just, uh, it's so exciting when kids get into it, you know. Well, thank you for Thanks sharing so with us again tonight. Um, we have been uh, talking here over the uh, edtechtalk.com um, channel of the World Bridges Network, and we want to thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo for that. And um, next week we get to kind of go through this again because um, Kevin Hodgins uh, does amazing stuff too. So uh, it would be great to see all of that work. Um, so join us again next Wednesday. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.